Does your job as U.S. men's national team coach depend on the success of Copa America this summer? Lexi, I just flew from Chicago, <laughs> four-hour flight, and that's the first question I get. Hello, Sunshine. I'm Alexi Lawless, and welcome to the State of the Union podcast, where we look at the beautiful game on and off the field through the lens of red, white, and blue colored glasses. This show will be talking all things U.S. men's national team with special guest Greg Burhalter. Oh, yeah. Uh, the U.S. women's national team Gold Cup start, referee drama, Open Cup drama, MLS doing big, bold things, dad of the year, and so much more. But first, joining me, as always, my friend, my colleague, my guiding light, David Mossy, a soccer savant and a Fox soccer researcher and writer extraordinaire. Masi, how are you doing on this uh, Wednesday, February 21st in the year 2024? How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing well. I do miss uh, Stu Holden not having him on the desk today. Hey, he brought it uh, last show. He was wonderful. We got lots of wonderful response. Uh, but uh, to, to, to finish up the story that we were telling on the last show, how is your eye? How is the sty, my friend? So when I went to the optometrist on Saturday, he had originally opted for a conservative treatment uh, that was going to take about 10 days or so, he said, to clear it up. I called him on Monday after the pod and I said, is there any way we can speed this up? And so he prescribed some antibiotics, which I've, I've been taking. And everyone seems to think that there's been a marked improvement since Monday. So I think we're on the road to recovery. Yeah, you look be you look good. Uh, you are on the road to recovery. I like the fact that you called him. Did you tell him uh, my job is kind of on air and uh, in front of camera? I did. Boy, you, and he, he was like, well, you should have told me that before and I would have gone right to the antibiotics. Correct. Oh, my goodness. You watching anything? Uh, I've got a few things. I'll whip through them quickly. Okay. Um, there was a TV show. I never mentioned it, but I was watching a parallel to True Detective called Monsieur Spade. Uh, now, you're familiar, obviously, with the Maltese Falcon, Sam Spade, the famous movie. Uh, this TV show picks up where that story left off. It aired on AMC. Six episodes. It's done, so you can watch it. I recommend it. It was uh, quite good. Um, I also watched this documentary on Netflix, Einstein and the Bomb, which I thought was a very good companion piece to Oppenheimer, but two thumbs down from you, right? I, I, I couldn't get through it. It, it didn't, didn't, didn't take, you know, and maybe it's just me. So I, I, I know what you're talking about and it's there and it's featured. And obviously it was designed to coincide with the fact that Oppenheimer was coming out on uh, Paramount or whoever it was for uh, for them over there, but I just didn't like it. And then lastly, as soon as we're done taping this pod, I'm going to go to the Aero Theater in Santa Monica for the special screening of 20 Days in Mariupol, which is probably going to win the Academy Award for Best Documentary. It's about the Ukraine-Russia war. It's supposed to be very powerful. So, Wow. Uh, All right. Well, we, we, we'll get a report on that. Uh, uh, I don't have much. I didn't watch a whole lot, although I will tell you a story. I came back uh, home from, I was traveling, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, and I came back home and... Uh, my wife was like, uh, yeah, I'm mom of the year. She, she had uh, let the kids, I have teenagers at home, watch Silence of the Lambs. Oh, boy. <laughs> they loved it. They, I mean, they weren't freaked out ab about it or anything like that. I don't know if that's a good or bad thing, but they weren't freaked out about it. And they're at the point where they can, you know, they can be scared and, you know, laugh about different things. But so now I, I had to inform them that, you know, there's other parts of this franchise now they're not as good nothing as good as the, uh, the original and i know we're talking now about um jodie foster and uh in the fourth season of uh true detective and all that which i by the way did start finally because i can binge it all the way through not done with it yet but we watched hannibal the other day and so i think we're going to make our way through all of the uh the films out there and go back to i guess what would be Manhunter was the original one that came out in 86, and then Red Dragon was a remake of that Manhunter. So there's a lot of different time jumps when it comes to that. I mentioned the Academy Awards. There are only a handful of movies that have won what's called the Big Five, which I believe is Best Picture, Best Director, Best Actor, Best Actress, and Best Screenplay. And Silence of the Lambs is one. It's the most recent movie to accomplish that feat. Well, I will tell them that, that they are watching something historic uh, all right, listen, uh, let's, don't bore us, get to the course, right? You ready to light this candle? Let's do it. We got ourselves a wonderful, wonderful guest this uh, episode. The great Greg Burhalter has agreed to come back on the State of the Union. So without further ado, Greg Burhalter. Okay, look who's here. Greg Burhalter, uh, as I live and breathe, welcome back to right. the State of the Union, head That's coach right. of our U.S. men's national team. Now, look. Conventional wisdom in an interview like this says that we ease you into it, give you a couple softballs, and then go in for the attack. Uh, we, 
uh, as you have found out over the years, are anything but conventional. So my first question to you, Greg Berhalter, the head coach of the U.S. men's national team is, does your job as U.S. men's national team coach depend on the success of Copa America this summer? Lexi, I just flew from Chicago, <laughs> four-hour flight, and that's the first question I get. This man. is how we roll here, oh Mr. My Berhalter. God. I'm not even ready for that. Come on. I think that, um, you know, for us to achieve our goals and what we want to do, the Copa America is very important. We, got, we have to do two things. We have to learn how to beat the best in the world, and we have to learn how to thrive and knock out competition. And Copa America is going to be big for that. Regarding myself um, and, and the job, you know, one thing I've learned with the national team job is that it's one of one. You're always under pressure. You're always accountable for results. And I think that, um, you know, this is part of it. This is, I, I'm learning to live with the pressure. You know, I don't think there's any pressure that the outside can put on us or me personally that I don't put on myself. So we're very focused on achieving our goals and doing well at Copa America. But having been given a second bite at, uh, at the apple, if you will, uh, and, a, and a second having cycle. Having been giving? Having been yeah. given. Yeah. A second bite at the apple, right? You can at least acknowledge that you are under, I guess, more scrutiny and more pressure. And that this summer being probably the biggest tournament situation, not probably, it's going to be the biggest tournament situation before 2026, the pressure that comes with that. And if it does not go well, that's going to be a poor reflection, not just on you and we on the team, but relative to your job. I think that, um, you know, the, the most important thing is that the, con the team continues to develop. That's the most important thing. And it's it's hard to really pinpoint an exact game or exact tournament to say the team's not developing. I think that's, that's very difficult to do. And um, like I said, our job is to develop this team that when we get to 2026, we can really make this country proud. Now, the U.S. has two tournaments this upcoming summer, also the Olympics. Yes. Could you foresee some Olympic-eligible players who would be in your ideal 23 for the Copa America going to the Olympics instead? For example, there's been talk of splitting Balogun and Pepe up so they can both start in tournaments this summer. You know, the issue with that is it's a good theory. I think the issue with that is a lot of it depends on the clubs and the club's willingness to release the player for the Olympics. Um, there are certain players that we've earmarked to, to participate in the Olympics and we're just not sure it can happen. Um, we are prioritizing Copa America. Uh, for, you know, because we want the team to be together. We want the team to really experience this tournament because we know it's a fantastic tournament and we're hosting it. Um, but, you know, the Olympics are important also specifically to take another group of players and give them that international experience because we know when we get to the World Cup, that experience is going to be important. Come 2026, uh, as you mentioned, uh, it's not just an incredible moment. It's an incredible opportunity yes. for the players uh, and for you and for soccer in the country. I mean, we both lived through 94 and what that did in 99 with the uh, Women's World Cup here. Again, don't kill the messenger, but the U.S. women's national team, uh, I think, found a way to, shall I say, divide the country in the way they went about their business, Okay. Do you see part of your responsibility um, and part of your desire, whether it's this summer in Copa America and then obviously going through to 2026, to use this men's national team to maybe unite the country more and to have everybody celebrating not just this team, but celebrating soccer and putting a lot of those other things to the side? Yeah, you know, I would argue, though, that the, the women's national team, specifically in 1999, basically changed sports um, for women in America forever. I think the impact they had on girls and, and women in general in sports is, is lasting even today. So they had a huge impact. And I think we could have a similar impact um, on the men's game and soccer in general. And we take that very seriously. Um, you know, I'm really excited for, for the country to get to know our guys personally, to get to know how good of guys they are, how much they care for playing for the national team. You know, some of the backstories behind it, because it really is a special group of guys. Think about, um, you know, in 2006, we we're, were the, in Germany for, for the World Cup and we we're on the base in Rammstein. And, um, you know, there's a little boy that wanted to take pictures with the team. And, you know, you fast forward to, 
uh, 16 years later and that little boy is playing in the, for the U.S. in the World Cup in Qatar and standing in front of the military people when we invited them to training to thank them for serving our country. And that little boy was Weston McKinney. So we have some great backstories, you know, to, to, to what we're doing and to who our guys are that I think the, the, the American public, when they get to know them, would really fall in love with them. Uh, Gio Reyna, uh, you're somewhat ironically the coach that's given him the most playing time in the last six months or so. We know about the struggles getting on the field at Dortmund. He goes to Forest. It's early, but things not off to a great start there. We saw Christian Pulisic extricate himself from a bad situation at Chelsea. He's now thriving at AC Milan. How concerned are you about Gio? How important is it for him to find the right home this summer? You know, I think it's important to realize that Gio's still a young player and he's still finding himself. He's still finding exactly who he is a, as a player. And every player on our team has gone through times when they're not thriving or it's not going the best way for them. And so for Gio, it's no different. We're not panicking. We know he has a ton of talent. We know that um, he can be a game changer. And we're looking forward to the day when he's in the team each and every week and really starting to thrive and grow because we know how much quality he has and how, well, what a good player he is. You, you, talk, you mentioned Gio's talent. And while we can be specific about Geo, I, I think you can broaden it out because you've had the, I guess, the pleasure and the opportunity to work with a lot of very talented players. There would some that argue that this is the most talented generation and maybe the depth of talent is unlike anything that we have seen in the past. But is talent enough for some of these players? And I guess I'm asking you as a coach to talk to some of those young players out there where there's a lot of talented players. But talent, whether it's Geo or anybody else, that only gets you so far. And can you coach the rest of it or is it just something that's innate? You can definitely coach the rest of it. I think with a growth mindset, you know, people change um, and people can improve. And I think that, I don't think it's just about talent. I think you need the whole package if you want to be at a top, top level. And this is what we're talking about. I mean, there is a big difference between, you know, being at a good level and the absolute top. And the absolute top, you need the whole package. And I'm talking about a handful of clubs across the, the globe, you know, top five leagues, Champions League teams, like that's a high, really high level. And you need everything. I mean, soccer is so competitive. You, they're playing soccer everywhere in the world, right? So talent isn't just going to separate you from everyone else. You, so what are those other things? You need everything. It's a mentality. I think it's, um, it's a growth mindset. It's competitiveness. It's... Um, willing or the ability to take in instruction to learn um there's the physical attributes that you need i mean it's it's literally a whole package that you need and what we've seen is that our most successful guys have a lot of those attributes uh, we interviewed your former teammate brad frito recently and he expressed some concern about american goalkeepers going to places where they're not playing regularly we all want americans to test themselves in europe but are you worried at all that in recent years, American goalkeepers have found it tough to find a place in Europe where they can start regularly? Yeah, I mean, that's always a concern, right? Ideally, we want our players, all of our players, playing week in and week out, 90 minutes, being a big part of their team and contributing each and every week. That's not always the case. And when I talked about, you know, ups and downs with, with our player pool and, and we mentioned Geo having ups and downs and, and the entire player pool one, one time in their careers having, having these ups and downs, it's no different for our goalkeepers. And, we, you know, we're confident that they have the, the right mentality to get themselves out of it. You see Ethan move from Forrest to, to Cardiff and now he's playing every week. And we're confident that, that Matt and, and whoever our other goalies are, are going to solve their situations and, and come out on the, the top end of it. And, and that's, part of, you know, that's part of being at such a high level is that it's really competitive. You talked about players and that growth process uh, and that maturity isn't always linear and it can go up and down yeah. and back and forth. The same is, can be said about coaches. Yeah. Uh, I think I've actually asked you this before when we've talked about how I'm interested in how you have changed as a coach and, and specifically in things that you do now that you wouldn't have done or things that you don't do now that you maybe did when you first started with this, uh, with this national team and with this group as you have been given these multiple cycles now with this group growing up. You know, I think the beauty of, of how we work is, you know, we have this cycle. It's plan, perform, reflect, refine. And that never stops. So every camp we're focused on getting better. 
and and we we look at what we did in this camp. We say, okay, you know, was it good enough? If it wasn't good enough, what can we do better? We'll in, integrate feedback-based adjustments into the next camp. So it's this continual process of trying to improve. I, I think that if you look at yourself two years ago and think you were smart, it means you haven't learned anything in the last two years. So it's no different for us is, you know, we're always improving. We're always getting better, whether that's management, whether that's tactics, whether that's training sessions, whether that's game analysis and everything, we're always trying to improve. What have you learned then? What haven't I learned? No, I mean, it's a really interesting question because for example, Germany, we talk, if we, if we talk really specifics yeah. about Germany, right? So that would be an example of where, um, you know, our defensive structure against their 3-2 buildup, if we want to press, one player wants to press, the rest of the players want to cover passing options, um, but we're leaving another center back open that they can pass to, then the next player will go out and press, the rest will cover. I think against highly technical players, it's a difficult way to press because they'll just keep moving you around and you'll get frustrated. I think if you really want to say we're going to high press them, you have to go one versus one in that zone. You have to do it or else it's going to be really challenging for your team. So that would be an example. Uh, when Tyler Adams has been unavailable, you've tended to play with McKinney and Musa sitting and Gio as the 10. And we all assume that's partly because you didn't love your other options at the six. With Johnny Cardoso really emerging now, could you see a scenario where even without Tyler, you play more of that 4-3-3 with a pivot and McKinney and Musa in the midfield? Yeah, I mean, if you look at what he's doing at Betis, he's playing next to another player. So he he thrives, Johnny thrives, I think, next to someone also. But if you can also remember from, from World Cup qualifiers, we moved another player next to Tyler also. Uh, so it wasn't, you know, always Tyler's there alone. You know, we, we obviously miss him. He hasn't played with the national team since the World Cup. He's really important to the team. But uh, we've also played with a double pivot when he was around also. Uh, you're here in Southern California. Yeah. Um, this is going to be a very important place, not just this summer, but obviously in 2026. Why was... I, I'm going to use the word decision, all right? I know you and U.S. Soccer gave FIFA input, but why did it ultimately end up where the United States national team is going to base here in Southern California, play multiple games here in Southern California, and from a group perspective, play their group games in uh, on the West Coast? Yeah, I mean, I think it's important the, to make the distinction that we did not decide. We gave FIFA input. And, and what we gave them was we'd prefer not to have to travel different time zones in the group stage. We would prefer to be in a climate where, you know, we can maximize our training. And, you know, the West Coast is perfect for that. And when you think about, you know, being based in Southern California, moderate temperatures, stadium, state of the art stadium, one of the best stadiums in, in the world. Um, I think it'll be a, a really great environment for the team. When you think about now going up to Seattle and playing in front of that crowd and that atmosphere and that stadium um, and not having to travel this extensive, these extensive lengths, I think it's an ideal situation for our group um, to, to have a good tournament in 2026. But it, it doesn't necessarily spread the gospel around the other uh, to the rest of the country there because yeah, there's a lot of people that were disappointed that they're not yeah. going to be close to a game. It's not that they can't yeah, get to a game. And I can understand close. that. And, and I really believe that it's just not about, you know, the host cities or the host venues. We're trying to reach all the communities in the United States. And we really want to connect with the entire United States because it is really, you know, important for our team to make this nation proud in the, in the World Cup. So it's not just about being based in LA. And we, I, I actually feel bad that, you know, we can't be playing all around the United States, but it's, it's really challenging when you think about um, in the group stage going coast to coast. Uh, both Brandon Vasquez and Kate Cowell off to a good start in League MX. And although MLS and League MX are probably in the same level now, people seem to think there's an added cachet to doing it in Mexico. They, they're out of their comfort zone. They're doing it in a country where there's more pressure. The fans are more demanding. Do you feel that way? Um, what did you make of those moves and how do you equate a player performing in Liga MX versus MLS? That's a great question. Um, you know, there is a, a big debate about MLS versus Liga MX. Um, I think we've done a great job in the United States in, in youth development in these last 10 years. If you see the, the products that we've been pushing over to, to Europe and developing in MLS and, and leaving to go to, to, to Europe, I don't think Liga MX has done it the same as us. 
I think they've relied on, um, you know, talent from the outside to really push their league and drive their league. But it is a high pressure league. And, um, you know, when, when I was in discussions with Club America, it was really, uh, you know, exciting to be playing under that pressure, that coaching under that pressure every single week because it's very volatile there. And it forces you as a player to really push and, and to be focused on, on performing at a really high level every game. I was going to ask you about that because that was a crazy week with the Club America rumors and then you getting rehired by the U.S. How close did the Club America thing come? And was it ever a choice or as soon as the U.S. came calling, you knew that you were going to take the U.S. job? Um, you know, to me, it was about unfinished business. Um, so when when this, this opportunity came, it was something um, that I felt very strongly about. But in terms of Club America, it was very close. And, um, you know, one thing I could say, it's a, a really professional club, high level club, an exciting club and, um, you know, really good people there. So it was, um, you know, for me, it was a, a, a really good opportunity. We're recording this on the night of uh, the first game in the 2024 season of Major League Soccer. You just talked a little bit about That's Major right. League Soccer. But when it comes to the national team, um, there are very few players now starting uh, at what would be you know, a, the highest level and the biggest type of game for you on the national team that are actually also playing in Major League Soccer relative, uh, relative to the past. Now, plenty of them have MLS experience. They've come through MLS. Yep. When you look at MLS in totality... Yep. Has it been good for U.S. soccer? Has it helped you to do your job? Has it been good for the country and culture and evolution of the game? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> of course. Okay. Yeah, I mean, no, it's been a game changer. When you think about, when you think about the, the whole process from 1996 to now, without MLS, we wouldn't be where we are today. And in terms of we wouldn't have, you talked about one of the deepest rosters of all time or the most talent of all. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Major League Soccer and the investments by the ownership groups. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a league that's developed from a facility standpoint, from a, an academy standpoint, um, you know, from a stadium standpoint, from a fan um, exposure standpoint. Every, you know, MLS has grown tremendously over these last uh, 25 years. And I think that um, when a player plays in MLS, but particularly a young player, and then goes to Europe, it's not an insult to the league. I think it's a compliment to the league and, and compliment to the, what this league is able to develop. Almost every league in the world is a selling league, Right. So it's, it's common for players to move on and go to, you know, to different levels. And I think that, um, you know, MLS is instrumental in, in helping a lot of our players get a good start. Uh, one player to that point who everyone expected to go from MLS to Europe was Miles Robinson. Instead, he signs with Cincinnati. Uh, did he consult with you? Were you okay with that move? Yeah, I, I talked to Miles about it um, leading up to the decision. And, you know, something – what expectations don't change, right? For him, we want him to be playing at a very high level. We expect him to be one of the top defenders in, in Major League Soccer. We expect him to be on a team that's going to be competing for championships, be doing well in, in League's Cup and things like that. And if he can do those things, you know, we're confident that, that he'll be able to keep his place in the team. You have uh, lived and worked and grown up in this American soccer culture. Uh, you know, warts and all. It's It's... It's La Cosa Nostra. It is, it is our thing. Give me the best thing about the American soccer culture and the worst thing about the American soccer culture. Oh, man. The best thing and the worst thing. I, I mean, I think the, the best thing is that we, we continue to develop and we continue to raise the bar and we continue to give you know, people opportunities. And, and it's becoming, I think, uh, more defined. And what I mean is, if you think about how much it's grown since 94, um, you know, the World Cup hosting in 94, and, and think about, you know, the impact you, your group made on, on U.S. soccer, and think about now where it is and how much it's grown. And I think that, that to me is the best thing, is that we, we've taken something, this little seed, and we've grown beanstalks out of it. And, and you know, we should be proud of that. And I think it's... It's not always perfect, and it's not always linear, as, as you, you said, but we should be proud of our growth. Um, the worst thing, my gosh. 
we can't be perfect. Yeah. I mean, right? Yeah. No, I mean, I'm a positive person. Though, I know. So it's really, I know. What, what irritates you or frustrates you out there? It could be something specific on the field. It could be something big picture. I mean, the soccer wars that we have going out there, the infighting that we have, the politics that we have, and that exists everywhere in yeah, the world. Yeah, it happens everywhere. I mean, that's the thing is that we're, we're not unique with any of that stuff. That's, that's, that's sport in general. That's, development. Is there yeah. something in development that drives you crazy uh, that you see? Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about it. <laughs> All right. Yeah, let's let's keep going. And then when I think about it, I'll, I'll interject if okay. that's all right. We were talking yeah. off the air about the PSV Dortmund yeah. uh, Champions League game. Sergino Des having such a great season. Yeah. That red card against TNT was just so bizarre. Are you confident that was just a random one off? He's not a player that you have to worry about his no, discipline? I mean, that's a great question. I think that, um, you know, like anything, it's something that we need to work through as a team. It's not only, I'm not only upset with, with his response in that game, but I think everybody's response. And what I mean by that is, okay, you get a red card, but why do you lose the game? Why do we, you know, why did, you know, some players drop their performance after that happened, right? Why not raise your performance? Um, it's a, it, it was less an ideal situation to be put in. And, you know, he regrets it. And, and like anyone, um, you know, he has flaws and, and things to work on. But it's a learning moment for this team if we process it in the right way. If you are fortunate enough to continue on and lead this team into 2026, mm -hmm. do you think that there will be changes in that, you know, you took this team over and basically you were a, a papa with this, this group of babies and you nurtured them and fostered them and they have and almost grown up with you. But, you know, I... I would submit that I don't think there should be any sacred cows in that nobody is safe in their position. Do you anticipate and see that there will be new names and different faces relative to what we have seen in the past that come into play over the next couple of years that could star in 2026? I sure hope so. Um, you know, that's the nature of the game, right? It's the national team. It's a selection. You're, I certainly hope that there's young players now, other players that are pushing to get in the team that actually make their way into the team. I think it's good for, for the team, the regeneration, injecting new, new blood into the team. Um, so from when that, was the last time we've seen something like, I guess, I guess well, Balogun. I, no, but yeah, Lund Hansen, uh, the it left back, um, Balogun, Balo's a certain, certainly example. Who else do we have? Um, you know, Cardoso has been, been pushing now to get in the team. You know, there's, if you think about the team in the, you know, Kevin Paredes has been a, a guy who's come in and started. Paxton Aronson was in the group. So there are players pushing and it's, you know, I don't think anyone feels that their position is secure. I think everyone realizes that they have to perform to, to be on this team. And that's just the nature of the national team. And, and we never want to create it that, you know, people get too comfortable. Um, and, and I don't see that. You know, I see the group highly motivated. I see the group comes in and, and wants, to be, wants to be part of it. There's a great team culture. There's, um, you know, great professionalism when they're in camp. And, and that's what we expect. There's very clear standards and expectations for, for players being in our environment. Uh, last one for me, the 2026 final is at MetLife Stadium. You're from New Jersey, correct? Yes. Have you dreamt about what it would mean to <laughs> Every be? night, man. Every <laughs> night. <laughs> no, I mean, it would be, it, it, I mean, just thinking about it, 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 it's easy to talk about, right? It, it's a lot harder to do. I understand that. But, um, you know, it'd be an absolute dream come true if, if we can do it, if we can do it. I know it, it's challenging. We have to win um, four knockout games to, to do it, um, but anything's possible. So you're saying right here that when people either that know you, that are now going to continue to follow you through this summer and into 2026, hopefully, or people that you're hoping to bring into the tent and introduce the game to, they should believe in you and this team to do things that we haven't seen done before by a U.S. men's national team. Our expectations should be higher than anything that we have done in the past. Why not? That's a, you know why not? I think that um, when you when you think about the first four years, as you mentioned, babies, right? We had really young team. We played the youngest team in the world for the last four years, and we accomplished a lot. And why not take that and move that to the next four years and say, okay, let's go for it. I don't see any reason why we can't do it. When I think about the age of our guys, the experience that they're going to have, 
Um, they're going to have played, you know, another 150 club games. They're going to have another national team games under the belt, another um, international competition, add that to the last World Cup. They'll be ready. And, and you, need, you need that experience to perform at a high level. And the guys will be ready. We'll have talent. Um, we'll have the team work. And why not aim high? I mean, we're hosting the World Cup. Why not shoot for the stars? Did you come up with anything negative or bad? or critical ask or me another question i'll keep thinking about it <laughs> <laughs> all right we, well you know this gives us an opportunity yeah. to bring you back the next time all okay. right so yeah. you will go out there and you will yeah. think about it and i guarantee once you leave the studio it's going to come to you and you say ah that pisses me off and i should have used that going forward uh anything else to tell the folks from the state of the union when it comes to what we should be looking forward to the, uh, with this team whether they're on or off the field come on you want to break some news or anything no news to break. I mean, I just think that we have an exciting spring coming up with Nations League, exciting co summer coming up with Copa America. And I think now's the time to get on board and, and start following this team because it, it is a special group of guys. And, um, you know, it, it's going to be a fun summer. All right, my friend. Uh, Greg Berhalter, the head coach of the U.S. men's national team, getting Wait, ready for a big Before we leave, year. can oh, I you... say one more thing? I, yeah, I, I of forgot, course. Yeah, I hey, forgot. You can stay here as long as you yeah. want, my man. I forgot to congratulate you on the nomination for the for the Ambient Awards. And I can't, I still am undecided. Is that a good thing? <laughs> or a bad, I mean, Ambient Awards, what is that saying about a podcast? Well, first off, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> this little thing has grown into something big, but it's only because of all the work behind the scenes. We have wonderful men and women that you have met and then getting good guests. You, my friend, uh, are a good guest. You are welcome back here anytime. You always answer uh, the questions and you all have, always have something interesting to say. You know, the last time he came on with us, you two went out to dinner and I recommended an Italian restaurant. Oh. Best, oh my yeah. gosh. And uh, it was a disaster, right? Because the portions were too small. No, and I'm still was... dreaming about that restaurant. Seriously, the food, the food was, was amazing. The food was delicious, but the portions yeah. were too small. Uh, your food cannot be delicious <laughs> if it comes on a plate and there's just a little piece, all right? That takes away the deliciousness of it because it doesn't satisfy me in the least. Food should be satisfying, okay? That that little morsel tastes good does not mean that the food is good. He's right. from Detroit. That's why he's saying that. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. He needs oh. the big portions. I like those little tomatoes and that little whatever sauce that was. That was incredible. There you go. Oh, my goodness. All right. Well, we'll see where we're going out, to, going out tonight. You got anything left? For, for That's him? it. No, we're, we're all good. All right, my friend. Thanks. All right. Again, thank you to uh, Greg Berhalter for coming on the show. I thought he was you know, really, I think, confident and calm and comfortable in the setting said some really, really interesting things. Masi, I thought you were wonderful, by the way, uh, in the questions that you asked. They were probing and they were interesting and they were to the point. I loved that, um, but I should expect nothing less uh, from you. What'd you think of uh, Greg Berhalter? I thought he was great. We're two for two with Greg Berhalter on this podcast. Uh, that was quite the first question you asked him. You know, it's, it's like I said, we could have just kind of eased it in, but he's got to expect these things at this point because it's what people are talking about. In fairness, it was on my list. If you hadn't asked that, I would have. Of course, have. you, you got to ask that. Yeah. Uh, keep in mind that from a U.S. men's national team perspective, as he mentioned, Nations League coming up. Uh, semis versus Jamaica, that's on the 21st for a possible another Nations League win. And then obviously this summer, the big one, whether he thinks it or not, uh, I do think that his, the future of his job depends on that being successful, Copa America, this summer. All right, let's take a quick break. When we come back, we got a uh, Champions League action recap, and we pre preview the MLS weekend th uh, that is upon us in the new 2024 season. Okay, before we get to a uh, Champions League action review and a preview of the MLS uh, weekend, uh, there was some women's world, uh, women's world cup, women's national team action uh, right down the road from us down at uh, Dignity Health there as they go through their uh, W Gold Cup. Yeah, tournament. the first ever women's gold cup is off and running. The U.S. women with a 5 0 opening win over the Dominican Republic. Moultrie got two, Lynn Williams got one, and then Nai Swanger and Alex Morgan both from the penalty spot. Alex Morgan, a late injury replacement for Mia Fischel, who tore her ACL. We'll start there. I do have a couple of thoughts. Uh, there is an issue in the women's game with these injuries. Uh, I've read the theory that as the women's game has grown and they're playing more games, the training methods haven't caught up to it. Whatever the case, we did a World Cup last summer where like 10 of the 20 best players in the world were absent through injury. It was still great, but it would have been even better if we had had Macario and Beth Mead and Vivian Miedema, et cetera. So horrible news for Mia Fischel, who's a real up and coming star. And something needs to be done here in the women's game because there are way too many injuries. So what has to be done? change of the rules. Uh, I mean, look, as, 
as time goes by, we will learn more from a medical perspective. I mean, traditionally, that is what happens. We get much more clued in as to what potentially are causing these things, and therefore we can be more protective going forward, whether it's a change of, uh, of rules or fundamentals in terms of what we teach or the way that we play. I don't know. But to your point, it just continues to happen. Uh, second issue, I mentioned Alex Morgan was the injury replacement for me official. That follows Becky Sauerbrunn taking Alana Cook's place. When the original roster came out, we all hailed that as the start of a new era, this rejuvenation that needed to happen. And nothing against those two, Sauerbrunn and Morgan. They're both legends. But uh, it does kind of undercut the whole theme of this tournament to put him back into the mix. Yeah, I mean, look, I get it. It's easy at at the eleventh hour when a player goes down uh, to just call up Alex Morgan. It's not like you're just calling up any player. You're calling up a legend who's right down the road, doesn't have to fly anywhere, and can come up and not miss a beat and even get on the field and score and score a goal. But to your point, it's it's a little deflating thinking that that corner had been turned, but. When you see Moultrie score two goals, when you see uh, N- Nicewanger, who I think is a real interesting player over there on that left-hand side with her, uh, with her left foot, th- those, are, those are good things. But it was a little deflating, like I said, when it's, all right, we're back to Alex Morgan. And, you know, Becky Sauerbrunn missed the World Cup, and they can certainly do the job. But there also comes a point where you move on from a generation. And I don't think that anybody would say right now, I know Emma, uh, is doing things from from behind the scenes until she gets there full time. But you would just would have liked to see, especially in this situation, a tournament situation, getting ready for the Olympics and then, for, and then as they go on, to really make a clean cut from the past. Next up, the UEFA Champions League. We had four round of 16 first legs uh, this week. We begin on Tuesday. PSV Dortmund finished 1-1. Best and Tillman started. Pepe came on as a sub. Daniel Malin scored in the first half for Dortmund against his former club. And then Luke de Jong equalized from the penalty spot in the second half. A very controversial penalty. Mats Hummels called for a foul on Malik Tillman in the box. <laughs> what do you mean it's controversial? To Mats Hummels? I, a lot of people had an issue with this call. You did not. No, I mean, you, you, it's 2024, Mats Hummels. And you can't play like it's 1996. <laughs> you... And so screaming, yelling of, yeah, I got the ball. I got the ball. Yeah, but, but then you clean the player out. And look, I, I love these tackles. I lived off of these tackles in the past. But one, again, know the era in which you're playing. Two, know the area in which you are playing. And so, you know, I mean, I, I have no problem ultimately with this call. And Mats Hummels is going to feel aggrieved. But, you know, I ultimately thought that PSV was the better team. And so in a strange way, even with that call, whether you agree with it or not, Dortmund got away with one here in this uh, getting a point. Absolutely. Or, uh, point, just getting a, a, a tie. Yeah. Also on Tuesday, uh, Inter with a 1-0 home win over Atletico Madrid. Arnautovic scored in the second half after coming on for the injured Marcus Turan. Inter clearly the better team. They probably should have won by more. They will take a slim lead back to Madrid for the second leg. Yeah. Remember we talked uh, earlier about you. This one was too, too hard to call for you. Well, this makes it even more. So, I mean, they give themselves very, very little wiggle room. And yet they had plenty of opportunity to put this one out of reach in terms of the, uh, the chances that they got. And ultimately, you know, deflection that went in. So they got their win. But, I mean, after watching this, still anybody's, right? Still, yes. Yeah, still could go either way. Absolutely. Okay. I picked Inter. I'll stick with that. Okay. But uh, absolutely, Atletico could still go through. Okay. Then we go to Wednesday. Porto with a 1-0 home win over Arsenal. Galeno scored in second half stoppage time. A long-distance strike that everybody hailed as a great goal. But you had a lot of issues with the Arsenal goalkeeper, David Rye, on this play. I, there's something off about this play. And I, I can't put my finger on it. Maybe I'll have to go back and watch it more times. But... I think the goalkeeper needs to get to this. It's almost as if there's a split second, a millisecond, in which the ball slows down or speeds up that messes up not just the trajectory of the ball, but the arc of the goalkeeper saving it. So there's something funky going on when it comes to this goal. I know everyone looked at it and said, oh, so this is a wonderful goal. I, I, I'm blaming the goalkeeper right now. And they're goalkeepers, so you know they, they deserve blame, whether it's fair or not. I still think Arsenal go through, but they now have a hill to climb in the second leg. Eh, I think they'll be all right. I agree. I think they'll be fine. 
Uh, Napoli, Barcelona finish 1-1. The two star strikers scored in the second half. First, it was Lewandowski and then Osimhen equalized. Lewandowski's goal was Barcelona's first knockout stage goal since a messy goal against PSG in the 2021 round of 16. And, you know, he, he took this one well. He's got a good first touch that sets him up. And so now you think, all right, let's see what, uh, what Napoli has. And they did come back. Is that a penalty or is that a, a foul? I mean, that's... A, that's No, that's... I've, I have no idea what Inigo Martinez was doing in that play, but us men just tossed him aside okay. like a rag doll. All right. <laughs> uh, okay, all right. But is this enough? Is this enough when it comes to, uh, when it comes to Napoli? Oh, well, I think Barcelona go through, but they have not been reliable at home. Keep in mind, they're not playing at Camp Nou. They're playing in that other venue. Uh, so there's not much aura there. So I think Barca go through, but it would not shock me if Napoli somehow pulled off a second leg upset. All right, what else you got? Uh, before we depart Europe, uh, one quick news story. Bayern Munich announced today Thomas Tuchel will leave at the end of the season. Uh, and they very much want Xabi Alonso to be the next coach. But Liverpool wants that as well. So it's game on. I've read tons of articles in the last couple of days. People debating which job should he take, Bayern Munich or Liverpool, which yes. is the better option. Yeah. What? I mean, him specifically, it, I mean, this, this matters. Because if it's just anybody and you look at the two, uh, I mean, I think you can make arguments both ways. But him specifically, given his past and what he is, I, oh God, I, I think, I think Liverpool. But, but the problem with Liverpool is, again, you're taking over for a giant and you could only, I guess, fail, right? Yeah, th there are pros and cons both ways. I don't think there's a clear cut right answer. I would slightly lean Liverpool. I think that's the better job right now. It, in terms of what it means to coach Liverpool? And just, uh, it feels like and a more anointing. stable club. Bayern are all over the place. They've really? cycled through too many coaches lately. And I think you're going to a more stable situation at Liverpool. Yeah. Or if he's going to play the long game and say, you know what? I'll let somebody come in there and fail at Liverpool. And I'll go be the savior over at Bayern Munich for a few years and then make my, make my way over like Pep did. Um, all right. What else? All right. Uh, next up, Major League Soccer. We are recording this on Wednesday afternoon. The season gets underway tonight with Inter Miami hosting Real Salt Lake. By the time you hear this pod, that game will have already taken place, so we can't say too much about it. But we have a full slate of games this weekend. We've picked out some of the biggest ones uh, just to whip through them. Uh, we've got Columbus, Atlanta, a rematch of an uh, entertaining round one series last season, which Columbus took uh, en route to winning MLS Cup. We know all the firepower on both sides, Cucho, Almada, Yakumakis, et cetera. So it should be a fun one here. All right. So I am looking at Columbus over Atlanta on Saturday. Um, what other ones do we have? Uh, we also have Cincinnati versus Toronto. That's the oh. supporter shield versus the wooden spoon from last season. <laughs> I mean, <sighs> Toronto. Remember what Toronto once was, Mossy? Remember? I mean, Unbelievable. It's, yeah. it's insane how, how much they have fallen. And it's not for lack of spending. They've spent plenty of money, and I guess they still want to spend money. So, I mean, they are, as uh, producer Sean would call them, the galaxy of the East right now in that they are living off of their past. But that only gets you so far here. So, But maybe this is the 2024 version. And for them to come out of the shoot and find a way to beat Cincinnati, that would certainly announce their, I guess, the return with authority. Uh, speaking of the LA Galaxy, they will host Inter Miami this weekend, so we get messy here in Los Angeles. Cross-country flight. All right. Uh, we heard uh, Greg Berhalter talk about how much travel can affect it. I mean, if I had more time, I probably would have gone into that a little bit more and how much the travel really does affect the players, especially in the modern era where they're all flying <laughs> on their charter airplanes and big seats and all that kind of stuff. But Miami's going to, like you said, uh, tonight they'll play and then they'll get on a plane and head across the country right now. Again, for the Los Angeles Galaxy, are you just continuing to pose and be the Los Angeles Galaxy? Or is there really something different about this version of the Galaxy? Between Messi, Suarez, Busquets, Alba, and Ricky Puj, this game is a former Barcelona player orgy. Well, there we go. That should, uh, uh, they should have T-shirts made up for that or scarves. I will say I'd love to go to this game, but the guy who was my ticket hookup with the Galaxy is no longer with the organization. He was unfortunately let go a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> they, they've fired all of your connects. Yes. <laughs> um, 
Also this weekend, Houston will face SKC. That's a rematch of a conference semifinal, which uh, Houston prevailed in 1-0 on a goal by Franco Escobar. So we watched, uh, again, we're recording this on Wednesday, we watched Houston last night go to St. Louis. So kind of a preview of what uh, what that team may be, right? Uh, did you watch any of the, uh, the games last night? Uh, I watched the highlights. I mean, you want to talk St. Louis, Houston first. I, I no, I just want to. I just want to say, I, 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 I had kind of said that Houston was one of my teams that was going to regress a little bit, um, and even though they lost to St. Louis uh, last night, um, I still think that they're a very good team in Major League Soccer, and I think they certainly can beat uh, the likes of SKC. Uh, Philadelphia won away to Saprissa Carranza with a hat trick, but I do have to ask you: Did you ever score an own goal like that? I've scored plenty of own goals. Eventually, you will put it in. Never quite like that. Mike Lapper once turned around and s- smacked one. It might have been against Tony Miola. By the way, Tony Miola's birthday. Happy birthday, Tony Miola! But I do remember we were in. It must have been like Japan or something like that. And he turned around in the same way and just smacked one back. And that was back when you could probably pick the ball up with your hands, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, In this situation, oh, not for nothing, this is Andre Blake, one of the great goalkeepers in MLS history. He, (laughs) you know, there was just a million things probably going through his mind. Having said that, uh, while that was a, a bad moment, Congratulations to the Philadelphia for going down to Saprissa, going down to Costa Rica, and getting a result. They ended up winning three to two, a huge, huge away uh, away result. So it was it was fun games. The St. Louis game against Houston was packed. Uh, so they're still coming out for their St. Louis team in their second year. And for those that think that uh, that St. Louis, like myself, is going to regress, la- last night was not an indication that that's going to happen. Also this weekend, LAFC Seattle. Also a rematch of a conference semifinal last season, which LAFC won 1-0 in Seattle on a Buanga goal. These should be two of the best teams in the Western Conference. They should be, but I think a lot more people are bullish about this version of Seattle here. And we talked about it earlier in the week. Um, So if they come out against LAFC and we say, ah, it's the same old Seattle, which is certainly good enough to compete and to make the playoffs, but I think there's expectations that that it's better that would be problematic uh, for Seattle. And LAFC, it's just kind of, they're LAFC. And in this day and age where sometimes it's down to little margins, have LAFC improved enough to make them better to get them over the hump? Like, they, you know, they got to the mountain and they're still a, a great and I think an elite team, but have they improved enough to really make themselves that much better that they can ultimately win the, uh, the prize? And then you mentioned St. Louis. They've got Rail Salt Lake. Man, uh, so this is a Salt Lake team that again will be coming off of a midweek game against uh, Miami, and so this will be their second game in the week and their second away game in a week. So if I was St. Louis, I would be uh, looking for an opportunity to feast upon a wounded animal that could be RSL by the time they roll into town. Uh, when we had Taylor Tillman on, I asked him about new coaches: Phil Neville, Caleb Porter, uh, Phil Neville at Portland. Uh, they've got Colorado and then Caleb Porter at New England. They're away to D.C. So these are all these, oh yeah, these all these Saturday, some Sunday games here. And, and we, we know that MLS uh, with the Apple deal has pretty much made the vast majority of the games happen within a Saturday window. It is their window. It is when they're showing, uh, showing those games. It'll be fun to see what the reaction is of this opening uh, opening weekend and whether it's the stories on the field, whether it's the stories off the field with uh, the coaches like you mentioned, including uh, Phil Neville, at least a new coach in terms of where he is, or new, co- uh, or new coaches like Caleb Porter in New England and um, uh, Uzzah, Dean Smith over there in Charlotte and those types of, uh, so those types of things. Hey, look, there's a lot of stories uh, uh, when it comes to MLS as they open up their 2024 season. I, I was having a conversation with someone the other day, though, that said they had not felt a MLS season when there was less attention and hype and acknowledgement and therefore um, relevance when it comes to a league. And that could be a function of you know, the Apple situation or any other number of things out there. We know that MLS is going through a bunch of drama. We'll talk about some of that here in the, uh, in the next segment right now. But... I hope people are tuning in. It's it's my league. It's always has been my league, and it, 
doesn't mean it doesn't have problems, but they're kicking off their 29th season. And if MLS kicks off um, and uh, in the middle of a woods, does it really make a noise? We'll find out. <laughs> uh, we'll get to some of the drama you mentioned in the next segment. All right, let's take another quick break. And like you said, uh, that next segment coming up is Ask Alexi, where we have some interesting things to talk about when it comes to what's going on with MLS and others. Okay, welcome back. It's time for Ask Alexi, that part of the show where you send in your comments, questions, and concerns. And keep in mind that our uh, handle out there when it comes to the social media platforms is SOTU with Alexi. Or you can call into our State of the Union podcast hotline, which is 657-549-2297, 657-549-2297. Mossy, what do the folks want to know this episode? Uh, first up, we have a voicemail. Let's take a listen right now. Hello, Alexi and Mossy. This is Devin from Northern California. Hope all is well on your President's Day. I have a three-part question on your favorite topic here, uh, referee and officials. So my first question here is, with the impeding lockout and start of the season here, how, do you, how does this impact MLS? Uh, second part is, seeing as this is Mark Edgar and Company's first year in the books, how, would, how have they fared compared to Howard Webb and PGMOL uh, with PRO? And my third question here is sort of a fun question, but looking back on your playing days, how has officiating evolved, good, the bad, and, of course, the pretty? Appreciate the podcast. Hope your President's Day is going well. And look forward to hearing more. All right, bye. Okay. Uh, thank you, Devin, from uh, Northern Cali up there. Thank you for the, uh, the voicemail. Uh, I think I got your questions here. Uh, and so taking them one at a time here, um, when it comes to the lockout that is going on right now, as we mentioned, we are recording this on Wednesday for the foreseeable future, including tonight with Messi's uh, first game with Inter-Miami of the 2021 season, there will be replacement referees. Now, uh, some people might call them scabs. Uh, some people might say that they are crossing a, a picket line, if you will. Uh, these are referees, domestic and international referees that have either refereed in the past at high levels or at this point referee um, as we speak in other levels and uh, other high, uh, high levels or medium levels, I guess you would call it. So it isn't as if they are putting referees out there that have no idea what they are doing. Uh, there are a portion of them that have worked with VAR and work in VAR leagues, but certainly not all of them. I think we're talking about 60 or 70 referees that they have managed to cull together to deal with the foreseeable future when it comes to what's, uh, uh, what's going on. Um, a lot of people will talk about safety, and certainly that has to be paramount for any league, any sports league. And if and when you have referees that are either inexperienced um, or are just not as good, at figuring out ways to control the game, you have the potential of putting players, uh, and I guess even others, um, at risk. And that's certainly not something that you want to do. And I think I mentioned the previous pod that what this group of referees have to figure out is how much leverage they actually have and how much people are going to care. As I mentioned before, people do not pay money to watch referees. Um, I think that they are confident. As a matter of fact, talking to people today uh, at MLS, they are confident that this is going to go off without a hitch. No, there will be problems. There will be problems that are associated with the lockout and the labor situation that's going on right now that have nothing to do necessarily with it, but will be attributed to it in terms of mistakes that are made or perceptions of mistakes that are made or subjective calls, uh, calls that are made. Uh, the, the situation right now is such that Major League Soccer is even in this moment in an effort to have the best possible games and to maintain safety, taking some things off the table that they were going to implement uh, this season, including, you know, for example, um, the uh, announcement and the in-stadium information from the referee relative to VAR and what's going on. So they're, they're basically simplifying as much as they possibly can. And if they were going to impl implement new things, which I think is a good thing, they didn't want to do it with replacement referees. So that might come in later on if and when this gets solved. As far as the evolution of the game and the evolution of refereeing, it's relative to the, the evolution of the laws. I mentioned uh, last... Uh, last podcast, that the things that I would do and that I was taught to do, especially when it comes to the aerial game, 
you would not even think to do, and if you do think to do, and we still see it every once in a while, you get dinged for it immediately, either in the moment or VAR finds you. I mean, we were taught from an early age to jump, jump with our arms out, to use our arms as a balance um, in order to get height and to protect yourself from others. And yet now you are responsible for your appendages. And when you go up in the air, even without any intent to hit anybody, and even if that opposition runs into your arm, it is your responsibility. And so the evolution of the game is that a referee has to recognize that and call it as such. The evolution of the game relative to the players is that you have to adjust. And players will adjust. Players will adapt. Because if they don't, they become dinosaurs and they die out. And I do think this generation is in this, this strange transition where the rules um, have changed and they have to change. And whether it's Mats Hummels or anybody else out there, if you have one, ha one foot or hand, I guess in this case, in the past and one in the future, you're going to struggle. But ultimately to your question, Devin, and we could go on and on about, uh, on and on about referees, they are to many a necessary evil. I just look at them as necessary. I don't think they're given the respect that they deserve on or off the field, I don't think we value enough how important they are to the running of a game. But I also don't think that, as I said, anybody pays to see them do their job. And the best referees, as we know, are the ones that you're not, you don't even notice and you barely even talk about. All right. Next MLS grenade they're dealing with, uh, Joshua <laughs> Smith on X State's Open Cup, dot, dot, dot. MLS is damaging the growth of the beautiful game in our country. What he's alluding to is the latest reports are that only eight MLS teams will take part in the U.S. Open Cup this season. Yeah, so this, this drama continues on. And, you know, part of this drama is playing out on social media. And when that happens, Mossy, you have to be wary. Uh, you have to be wary that X or whatever social media platform you have out there uh, that you use or that you look at you have to be really careful not to fall into thinking that it is a focus group uh, as opposed to an echo chamber and that a vocal minority can make things seem much more important than they are. And that is not to say that the Open Cup isn't important, that the Open Cup doesn't have a long history. And it's not to say that I don't enjoy the Open Cup or that I can't feel the romance of what the Open Cup is. But as far as Joshua Smith here saying that the Open Cup and the situation right now with the Open Cup, that MLS is damaging the growth of the beautiful game in the country, I, I don't think that that is true at all. I think that this is an MLS that is doing what they feel is appropriate for their business, and their business is soccer. When it comes to damaging soccer, because I know that there were folks out there that say that MLS in general, and we talked to Greg Berhalter about this, I asked him specifically, and did you see the look that came over his face when I suggested that MLS has been anything but positive for the growth of the league? And I think in general, people that like MLS and people that don't, MLS out, uh, don't like MLS out there, in general, they recognize how important MLS has been, not just to the growth of MLS soccer, but to soccer in the United States and all of the tentacles that, is in, that it has positively impact, impacted, including the women's game, uh, including the business of the game, including referees, including coaches, including opportunities, including pathways, all of those different things. And as we said, 29th year. So going into 30 years, and in 30 years, MLS has created the most successful professional league in American history without a doubt. I would even argue within North American history in what they have done in, in 30 years. And so I don't think anybody can argue that MLS has been detrimental to the growth of the league. This situation right now with Open Cup, I think it is going to get resolved. As we said, the rumors are that it's going to get resolved in a way where nobody's happy. There was even talk about USL pulling out and saying, well, if MLS isn't going to be there, we're not going to be there. If I'm USL, I look at this as an opportunity. One, you get a clearer pathway in order to get to CONCACAF Champions Cup, right? 
Two, you get the opportunity or you get the opportunity to again kind of be the team in this league. Now, I know that there are limited opportunities now when it comes to the cup sets out there. But again, I look at USL here as if and when you get to throw it in Don Garber and MLS's face that you are going to CONCACAF Champions Cup, I think that is worth its weight in gold, my friend. If and when a USL team, because they have a clearer path right now to that international competition, if and when they get that opportunity and they're there holding it, and keep in mind the last time that that happened that was a, that was a non-MLS team was back in 1999, the Rochester Rhinos. If now you are that much closer, man, oh man, now that's, that's something that you can lord over. That's something that you can celebrate. That's something that you can market. And it's been given to you right now. Mossy, anything on these? But you don't find MLS's whole tact here off-putting? I mean, shouldn't the uh, motivation be to improve the Open Cup, not to have MLS teams pull out of it? I mean, it's pretty clear that if it was up to MLS, they wouldn't compete in this at all anymore. Well, maybe the motivation is to have it improved. And maybe they got to the point where they said, you know what? This is the only way that we're going to have it, uh, have it improved. Now, there are those I'm sure that are listening saying, well, you're being disingenuous because we know that um, League's Cup, which is something that they created and went great guns and was wonderfully successful, but they have a vested interest in, in that happening. Keep in mind that the U.S. Open Cup, it existed for, what, 70 years before MLS came along? Uh, you know, or maybe even more when it comes to this historic uh, historic uh, tournament. So if they existed that long without MLS Cup or without MLS, why do they need MLS now? And I know people are sitting there saying, oh, you're being disingenuous and you're being trite and all that kind of stuff. And, and maybe to a certain extent, I am. But I recognize that MLS is doing what's good for MLS. But in doing so, I don't think that they are breaking soccer. As a matter of fact, I don't think that there's anybody out there when it comes to leagues out there that has done more to steer this uh, U.S. soccer c culture forward than MLS has. It has been groundbreaking and it has changed. Again, not perfect. Plenty of mistakes along the way. But relative to the past and the Wild West that existed and the hellscape, I guess, that existed, I mean, it is, it is night and day. I shudder to think what U.S. soccer would look like and what the American soccer culture and climate and landscape would look like without MLS. To the point you made earlier, though, about how the start of this MLS season is flying under the radar a little bit, yep. there's just a lot going on right now, if you stop and think about it. It's an incredibly busy year from an international perspective, as we just, as we just talked to Greg Berhalter about. You've got this Open Cup controversy. You've got the CONCACAF Champions Cup going on right now. You've got the League's Cup in the summer. And MLS almost feels like, oh, yeah, there's that, too. I mean, it, it's almost getting hidden a little bit amidst all this other stuff going I on. I mean, this is, this, is, this is the congestion that people talk about. And not just the congestion from a player's perspective, but the congestion in terms of we only have so much bandwidth, right? Uh, I mean, we have plenty of bandwidth <laughs> in terms of streaming services and all that kind of stuff. But as humans, there's only, I mean, we're, I know Sean Sullivan in particular, we are testing the limits of what a human can consume when it comes to soccer. But there is a limit. And at some point, you, you, you can't watch all of it. And you have to start to prioritize out there. And what MLS has to be careful of is, having others go, you know what, I, I can't fit all of this in and I'm going to start to prioritize. And if MLS isn't careful, people will go elsewhere and prioritize other things, either other domestic opportunities or, as we know, the influx of international um, leagues and games and tournaments out there that people might say, uh, this is what's going to be on my palate. That is it. All right. Thank you to uh, Devin and thank you to Joshua over there for asking questions. Um, and again, whether I agree or disagree with you, uh, I am thankful that there are people out there that send us in questions. And whether it's using Ask Alexi over there on the uh, social media platforms, or whether it's uh, like, uh, like Devin calling in on our, on our uh, voicemail with, uh, at 657-549-2297. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, one more break, and I'll come back with my one for the road. 
Okay, welcome back. It's the end of our show. As we mentioned, we're recording here on Wednesday, uh, a few minutes before Inter-Miami kicks off their season. We already got video of uh, the stars arriving down there in Miami. Oh, who's that? There's uh, Messi and uh, his friend, Luis Suarez. What's the stuff that they uh, drink down there? It's uh, mate. And as I read here, it's consumed mostly in Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay, and Brazil, as well as Syria and Lebanon. It is a hot, bitter, caffeinated tea made by steeping the dried leaves of the yerba mate plant. Wow. All right. Well, they're sharing their uh, their mate there as they get ready to take on uh, Salt Lake, right? Um, all right. So listen, it, it, it's, it's apropos because uh, I don't know if you read this, Mossy, but um, there was an article that came out earlier uh, this week that we, we retweeted, and it's out there, and we'll do it again so you guys can read it, but uh, from the great uh, Henry Bushnell over there at Yahoo, and it's called MLS is Ready to Take Off Its Financial Training Wheels. And I loved this article for a number of different reasons because it kind of laid out uh, some of the some of the history when it comes to this league. And for those that have listened, watched over the years, you will know that I have called time and time again for MLS to do big, bold things. I like big, bold entities. I like big, bold individuals. And especially nowadays, where we are a couple years before the World Cup. Uh, if there, is, if there ever was a time to do big, bold, audacious types of things, both on and off the field, this is the time. And you know, Henry does a really good job of laying out the history of MLS and the teams, especially when it comes to the infrastructure that they have and the intrinsic knowledge that they have and the, the leadership that they have and how it has grown over the years. Also, the incredible drama and dynamic that exists when it comes to the ownership as the league has expanded and all these new owners have come in and trying to satisfy them all and also trying to satisfy a recognition that they do need to do big, bold things. As a matter of fact, even within the article talking about how there was a possibility that they were going to do some bigger things, but they actually went back to the drawing board to try to come up with some possible bigger things. And I'll just read you the last par paragraph of this article because I think it sums up potentially what we could see here in the new future. Five club officials, including one older, told Yahoo Sports that they expect meaningful change in the near future, perhaps as soon as next offseason, which will be next uh, for the 2025 season. The product strategy committee, a collection of eight owners or club representatives akin to the NFL's competition committee, are knee-deep in a big-picture review with meetings scheduled in late February and the spring and a plan to present initial strategic conclusions to the board this summer. Their decision will set the trajectory of the league. Sweeping change could deflate the parity that we talk about all the time and create internal divides, but it could also allow MLS to maximize Messi, who we're just seeing coming on the field right now, to compete at the 2025 Club World Cup and to capitalize on what we've talked about so much, the 2026 World Cup, and to actually be a, quote, top league that it has always promised to become. Amen. I hope that this is happening behind the scenes. I hope that what comes out of this are these big, bold moves. I've talked in the past of things like buying USL. Uh, people have talked about merging with Liga MX. Th these types of things that on the surface might be pie in the sky types of things that can never happen. And certainly you can poke holes on all of these different things. But as I said, if there ever was a point to do it, and it shouldn't just be limited to MLS. Everybody should be thinking about doing big things. Everybody that's in this ecosystem, that's in this soccer ecosystem of doing big things leading up to 2026. You're never going to get a better time. I'm not saying do stupid things. And I'm not saying do things that are going to hamper you in the future. But I am saying with the focus of the world coming in 2026, and I think the willingness to not just accept, but embrace this sport in a way that is unlike anything we've seen in the past. And certainly back in 1994, when I was running around, it's a totally different landscape than then. Do big, bold things, all right? Don't be afraid that they are too big. Don't be afraid that they might fail. Because if this league, and I, I would extend it to this sport in this in this United States, is ever going to be what a lot of us dream that it can be and has the potential to be, then these types of big, bold actions have to come. And they have to come fast and furious. And like I said, it's not just limited to one league. So if it's USL, if it's NWSL, if it's any league out there, if it's any sports um, academy, if it's any coaches out there, if it's any individuals, it's any media out there, do it 
now. I think it will be rewarded in the long term, and there is never a better time than right now. So I'm glad that I'm hearing this, but I hope it's not just an article that, uh, that Henry Bushnell writes when it comes to Yahoo over here. I hope we actually see it, what he is talking about and what he is potentially saying could happen actually come to fruition. Mossy, another wonderful show in the books. Anything before we go? No, I'll just say on your point, I agree 100%. The thing I've always said about MLS is the playoff format with single elimination games already guarantees a certain degree of parity and unpredictability. It's never going to be like the Bundesliga. So I think all those other rules that are aimed at parity, some of them are just overkill and unnecessary. So I do hope they loosen the strings a little bit. Well, uh, we want to thank Greg Berhalter again for coming in to be on the State of the Union yet again and in studio. I thought it was really, really interesting. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. And we'll have him back again because... Um, at least at least for the foreseeable future, he's not going anywhere, but we'll see what ultimately what happens uh, this uh, this summer. But we appreciate that he spends the time and comes in and answers our answers our question. And we do wish him luck. And he understands that he's going to come in for criticism, and that's just part of the job, part of the gig. Uh, and he's a big boy, and he can certainly uh, certainly handle that. Continue to review, continue to download, continue to rate, and do all the different things that you do out there. We appreciate it so much. Whether you're listening, whether you are listening and watching on all the platforms that we have out there, we appreciate you joining us here for the State of the Union. We'll talk to you again next week. Enjoy your soccer this weekend. And until then, and as always, my friends, size the game.